Hello, and welcome to the CNS Nurse Degree 100 video on antiplatelet and anticoagulation medications in traumatic brain injury. My name is Laura Nguyenya, and I'm the director of the Neurotrauma Center at University of Cincinnati. Let's take a typical case example. This is a 66-year-old female who presents after a fall from standing, who had some loss of consciousness, has a known past medical history of coronary artery disease, and had a recent bypass three months prior with stents placed. Because of this, patient is on medications that include dual antiplatelet therapy of aspirin and clopidogrel, and this is for those recent stents. And on exam, patient has a GCS of 346, losing a point for eye opening and a point for having a little bit of confusion, but otherwise has a symmetric motor exam and without any neurologic deficits. Here's the imaging. You can see there's a little bit of scattered traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, including some convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage, but no midline shift, no sulcal effacement. So what would you do with this patient? Do you observe the patient? Do they go to the ICU? Do they go, go to a step-down status or to the floor? Do you reverse their aspirin and clopidogrel use? Do you use GDABP? Do you use platelets? If you instruct that the patient should not be on this therapy anymore, how long should they stay off of it? For three days, for a couple weeks, for a month? How do you make the decision for when to restart? And what if this were a patient that had chronic atrial fibrillation and was on, and was on apixaban? How would that change your management? These are all questions which often come to the neurosurgeon to decide what the answer should be. The broad category of antithrombotic medications includes antiplatelet agents as well as anticoagulation agents. And despite the increasing prevalence of these medications in the community, when a patient comes to the hospital with a traumatic intracranial hemorrhage, it's generally up to the neurosurgeon to decide whether or not to discontinue these medications and when to resume them, if at all. In order to help with those decisions, it's necessary to have a general understanding of what these medications are and what the indications are for why patients are on them in the first place. A common type of medication are the antiplatelet medications. These include medications such as aspirin, which block COX1 and 2 to inhibit platelet aggregation. You also have the ADP receptor inhibitors, and those include medications such as clopidogrel. These irreversibly inhibit P2Y12. There are diagnostic tests for these, such as platelet function assays. And reversal of these is, is difficult. There is some weak evidence that DDABP or desmopressin, given at 0.3 micrograms per kilogram IV, can help with the with the functioning of platelets. Oftentimes, platelet transfusion is recommended. However, it is noted that this only adds platelets to the system and the currently circulating platelets are still dysfunctional. And these platelets tend to be in the system for about seven days. At University of Cincinnati, we have a protocol for which when patients arrive to the hospital and they are on any of these antiplatelet medications, we first will assess whether or not they actually are taking them by using a platelet function assay. This helps us determine whether or not the patient is taking the medications and whether or not they seem to have dysfunction of their platelets. For patients that have a non-surgical bleed, we will give DDABP. If we think the patient could potentially need surgery or needs a bedside procedure or we're just concerned given a large bleed, then in addition to DDABP, we will give platelets as well. Heparin is a medication that is often sometimes used. This can be detected with the diagnostic test of, of an APTT, and usually that's reversed with protamine. Vitamin K antagonists, such as warfarin, can inhibit the production of multiple platelet clotting factors, and usually a diagnostic test such as INR is used. There's a variety of different reversal agents, such as vitamin K, four-factor PCC, and FFP. And we have a protocol at University of Cincinnati where, again, we use lab values to help direct whether or not someone should be reversed. We use an INR of greater than or equal to 1.5. 
For patients in which we are concerned that this bleed could be life-threatening or require surgery if it were to get worse, we generally will reverse their, their warfarin use with PCCs. If PCCs are not available, we then will consider using FFP. Because of the expense of these medications, if a patient is deemed to be non-survivable, we generally will wait and have discussions with family rather than giving PCCs. Direct thrombin inhibitors are also common as part of the overall group of the uh, direct oral anticoagulants. The diagnostic test for, for these can include PT and APTT. For some medications, there is a specific reversal agent, but these are not always available. So PCCs are oftentimes considered in patients that arrive with a direct thrombin inhibitor. For a direct 10A inhibitor, such as apixaban, a diagnostic test in addition to the APTT is actually an anti-factor 10A, which can, be, which can be tested if available. The first line reversal for these medications is indexin at alpha, with the second line being PCC. Our protocol for patients that arrive with a direct 10A inhibitor include first trying to determine the timing of the last dose and trying to verify for sure that this medication is active in their system by testing for an anti-10A. The first line reversal is indexin at alpha. However, this is an extremely expensive medication. So we assure that we need to give the medication by first evaluating the scan and whether or not this is a potentially life-threatening bleed. For patients in which they are deemed to be non-survivable, we do not give indexin at alpha. When indexin at alpha is not available, PCCs can be given as a second line. So when a patient arrives with a traumatic brain injury with intracranial bleed, and they're on some of these medications, do you hold the medication, do you reverse it, and when do you resume it? So the severity of the patient imaging and the overall clinical picture really should guide the decision making. Surgical patients generally need immediate reversal, and they may need antithrombotic medications held until their post uh, first post-operative visit. Oftentimes, the initial indications for why a patient was on an antithrombotic medication in the first place can help guide the resumption strategy, especially in non-surgical patients. Therefore, it's useful to have an understanding for what the recommendations are for why patients are on some of these medications. For antiplatelet therapies, there are a variety of reasons why patients can be on these medications, the most common being for stents, for myocardial infarction, for ischemic stroke, and oftentimes for just general heart health. For anticoagulation medications, a very common reason that patients are on these are for atrial fibrillation, but they can also be on it for a heart valve or also for a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. Guidelines by the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and the American Stroke Association have recommendations for how long patients should be on different antithrombotic medications. And it's useful to be familiar with these as oftentimes patients are on medications for much longer than they need to be, and therefore they may not need to have their medication resumed, especially if they have had a large bleed that puts them at risk. In general, if a patient has had a acute coronary syndrome, such as a myocardial infarction, they are generally on a medication up to about a year. If they've had stents, they're usually on dual antiplatelet therapy for six months to a year, and then monotherapy after that. Mechanical valves generally need lifelong therapy. DVTs and PEs need three months of therapies, and if there's a second event or if or if they have some other predisposing factor, such that this was not a provoked event, then oftentimes they need a lifelong therapy with anticoagulation. Strokes and TIAs are generally three months of dual antiplatelet therapy and then monotherapy afterwards. Atrial fibrillation is often lifelong anticoagulation. 
and someone with a factor deficiency disorder also needs lifelong anticoagulation. So in making a decision about when and if to resume somebody's antithrombotic medication after a traumatic brain injury, it can be useful to think about the patient's risk for having a thromboembolic event in the future based on their initial indications for being on the medication in the first place. This is a simplified risk stratification method that we use at University of Cincinnati in which high-risk patients, if we deem it safe, will resume their medications within three days. Moderate-risk patients will resume within seven days, and low-risk patients will resume at 14 days or longer. Again, this is based on each individual patient's clinical picture, including the nature of their traumatic brain injury, the extent of their bleed, and whether or not they've had to undergo any surgical intervention. So what about our typical case from the beginning? This is our 66-year-old female that had a fall and had coronary stents placed three months prior. Their exam improved to a GCS 15. We did do a CTA, which was negative. We admitted the patient and did neuro checks every two hours. And because of their use of both aspirin and copritigrel, we did give them DDAVP. This head CT was deemed to be non-operative, so we did not give platelets initially. We repeated a head CT at six hours, which was stable. Due to the fact that the patient was doing well and we had a stable scan, we recommended resumption of the aspirin and the clopidogrel at seven days due to the recent stents. We also followed up this patient in clinic at about two weeks after the injury with another head CT just to ensure that there was continued stability and improvement of the bleed. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video today. And thank you to all of my colleagues and partners at the University of Cincinnati, especially including not only our neurosurgical surgery team, but also neurocritical care, emergency medicine, pharmacy, and our acute care surgery and trauma service. And a special thanks to the University of Cincinnati Gardner Neuroscience Institute Neurotrauma Center. Thank you.